Hey all, John's here. Today, I'll be showing you how to make your very own custom quest here in Rec Room. I'll almost be using CV1 since that's what I'm more familiar with. Um, and I'm about as good with CV2 as I am with social interaction, which is to say not at all in the least. This video will also be segmented into chapters down below or to the side if you're on PC. Uh, so if you feel like you're already familiar enough with the topic, you can go ahead and skip. And uh, with all of that all the way, let's get into the tutorial. So, to begin with your very first level of your quest, we're going to, of course, pull out our maker pen, in which preloaded stuff is already in here. And as with any game-based, well, game in Rec Room, you're going to need a game chip. So I will simply pull one out. Game rules chip. Right there. And we will then configure it, open game rules, and this is where you'll find a ton of options of which you can customize your quest experience to make it as unique as you want it to be. Uh, I mean, there's player HUD, friendly fire, uh, shields if you want to get into that kind of stuff, spawn equipment, tons of things like that. But what you're really going to want to focus on is up here at the very top, <laughs> uh, where it says name and mode name. What I like to do is change the mode name to whatever the name of the current level you're in is. So here I'll just do beach, as that's what this preset is. And then, this is important, apply game configuration. What you're going to want to do is start here and choose quest. Apply quest configuration. Now it should be all set up to be like, the, uh, like Golden Trophy and Crimson Cauldron, that kind of setup. You have the basic uh, one health, no HUD if you get hit, no respawn, high five to revive. But again, you can change all of that here in the settings menu. It can be pretty fun to toy around with it, so I would suggest uh, looking into that until you find a system that you really like. As of right now, it's set up to start manually, which I personally would not recommend, as you will have to pull in a scoreboard. Press the start uh, button on the scoreboard to play. Thanks, coach. <laughs> You're going to need to pull in a scoreboard chip and when the players load in, you're going to have to build them their own little caged-in area here, and they're going to have to press start. It's a whole thing, is it not? Plus, it, t it costs more ink. So first, I will be showing you how to make it so that when your players spawn in, they will have a leaderboard set up here. They will be boxed press the in their own... Press the start button on the scoreboard to play. Thank you, coach. Their own little room, and they will have to press the button to start it. And when it ends, they just respawn right back here, and they don't even have to worry about it. I personally would not recommend this mode, however, as if you're setting up a quest level which has items that spawn, despawn, or story triggers that are only supposed to happen once, the more complicated it gets, the more frustrating it can be to have to reset all of it at the end, and more ink costs too. So uh, if you go with this method, uh, do just be wary of that. Anyways, this setup does not take long at all. All you'll really need are one or two respawn points. Respawn. As I brilliantly typed there. Press the start button on the scoreboard to play. Thank you, coach. So I'm going to place one, two. And we're going to configure one of them to be during game, team to respawn any. I would use area precision so that all the players don't spawn on top of each other. And with the second one, we will set it up to be post game. Now we simply take these two and place them right on top of the welcome mat. Assuming this is where you want your quest level to start, this area here. Next, we're going to want to pull out a scoreboard. Scoreboard projector. Press yep. the start button be on already... the scoreboard to play. Thank you, coach. It should be already set up with it just laid out. I oftentimes like to scale it down so that it's not 
kind of in your face there. And freeze it, of course, and this will be where your players start. I would recommend using invisible collisions to kind of box them in so that they can't get into the level without um, starting it first, of course. And that should just about do it for the automatic, or pardon me, the manual setup. Now, for this next part, I'm going to show you all how to do a automatic game over setup. This is what I would recommend for your rooms. Um, with another bonus that I did mention earlier is that it can be more immersive um, for the players in the room. There are two different ways for this second setup. You can have it so that it automatically sends players to another subroom at the end of the level, or you can have it so that it sends them to a dedicated little mini area in this in this subroom, which then they can go through a door and have it have like a little game over screen and everything, which is what I use in my custom quests if you're familiar. But we'll go with the first one first. For for first. For the first one for the <laughs> first one first. So to start with this automatic setup and automatic game over, we are going to start by deleting the scoreboard. Sorry, scoreboard. And we will get back to the automatic setup at the end of this step. First, we'll focus on the post game. Now, to set it up for the post game, there are a few things we are going to need, which we are going to find in our palette. This may not be the best method, but this is what I'm used to. We're going to start with animation gizmo. A trigger volume. Press the start button on the scoreboard to play. And oh. And a game state chip. Now what we're going to do is link the game ended pin on the game state chip up to the start of the animation gizmo. Then we're going to want to configure the animation gizmo um, and make sure that it is set to all the right settings and disable allow holding. Now, once you have done that, press the start button on the scoreboard to play. Thank you, coach. We are going to take this trigger volume, and what you're going to want to do is scale it up so that it covers your entire quest level. I am not going to do this for the simplicity of the tutorial, but just know that when you're doing this for yourself, you are going to have to do that. Next, we'll want to pull out a room door. We're going to want to configure it to whatever subroom you wanted to take the players to. You could have a dedicated subroom for the game over, which could then take you to the lobby, or you could just straight up have this take players back to the lobby. You're going to want to configure it, turn on everyone auto follow, force new instance, uh, and hide sign. Press and the hide start door. button on the scoreboard to play. And then you're going to want to link it to the other subroom. This room that I've created has no other subrooms, but this is where you would select the lobby or dedicated game over subroom. To finish it off, we're going to connect the when entering zone pin to the activate player ID pin. And we're going to connect the gear part of the animation gizmo to the trigger volume itself. Now what you're going to want to do is click edit, edit the animation gizmo, and make it so that the first state is down below your quest level. Make sure it's below the any place. On the scoreboard to play. Thank you, coach. Make sure it's below any place where the players could reach it or accidentally touch it, as then it could then set them to another room. Then you're going to want to add a second state. I like to make it a tenth of a second or a fifth of a second. And on the second state, we're going to move 
Oh, goodness gracious. Rec room, what did you do to your UI? We're going to move it up above the quest level, up to about the highest point. Which, in this level, would be about ground level there, but just to be safe, I like to put it up even higher. Now, if you test player animation gizmo, yeah, you'll find that it does that. But, when it does do that, what'll happen is it'll interact with the player and it'll send a signal to the door to send that player to the select subroom. Press the start button on the scoreboard to play. Thanks, coach. Now, this animation and trigger volume setup I find can be really helpful, especially when you need to uh, increase a leaderboard uh, stat to every single player in the room, as it's kind of a catch all. And this is just a CV1 way of going about it. I'm sure CV2 has plenty of other ways, but. This is not the video for that. And that is how you set up the automatic subroom teleport setup. I would suggest using this setup. Uh, and if you do, you could also use a delay chip and a message chip to have a little game over message if you want as well. But now we're going to focus on the room in subroom game over message setup. What you're going to want to do for this is make a little room. Uh, for somewhere out of sight of the rest of the quest level. And, going to use the same door for simplicity, take that subroom door Press and the plop start it in button there. on the scoreboard to play. We'll say that this little area will be that end game room. We're also going to want to take the post game specific respawn point and place it right in front. Just like so. Next, we'll want to grab an animation gizmo. And we'll place it next to the state chip. We'll ignore this other one for, for the moment. What we're going to want to do is take the game ended pin and connect it to the animation gizmo, then configure the animation gizmo to not allow holding and to Press stop the start at button end. on the scoreboard to play. The stop at end is important because if you don't, it'll just keep repeating the animation over and over and over. That being said, you are gonna be want to sure you are going to want to be sure that it's set to loop as well. Then you'll want to connect the gear part of the animation gizmo to the during game respawn point. And we'll edit the animation gizmo to be one frame long. It can be one to three seconds long. For the first part of the frame, we'll have it be here where it normally is. And for the second frame, we will move it to be where the other respawn point now is. Once we're done with that, we'll set it back to its original state. And as you can see, now when the game ends, it will move the start point over here. So if the game does automatically start again, it will not take the players. Press the start button on the scoreboard to play. Thank you, coach. Now, if the game does automatically start again, the players will not get placed back at the start and they will not get a do-over. So we will click done on that. Now this is where in my quests, oh, I can't believe I forgot. We're going to want to configure the door once again and enable, or rather disable, hide sign and hide door. Or at least the hide door. I like to have the sign down, but you do whatever you want. This is where you would have your game over message. Uh, heroes can try again, whatever you want to put. And now the players will be trapped in this figurative room. Press the start and button on the scoreboard to play. Coach is interrupting a lot today. Then you can take the door back to whatever subroom you wish, such as the lobby. Now, finally, for the base setup of the room, we're going to set it to have an automatic start. All we'll need to do for this is go over to our game rules chip. And we'll want to open down the automatic start requirements. And here at the very top, uh, we're going to want to enable 
automatic game start supported. Don't do it yet though. What you're going to want to do whenever this happens is open up your watch, go to this room, go to save room, and then it's kind of tricky. You'll want to set the automatic game start Press the start button on the scoreboard to play. timing to be about three seconds I like to do. Probably safer if you do five seconds. And then right as you're about to save, very quickly click this pin to enable automatic game start and then save the room. Now, whenever you come into the room, the game will automatically start whenever you enter. Be sure to do this as your last step though, because having Whenever you have to edit the subroom, you'll have to come in, disable it, reset the animation gizmo, and it's a whole thing every time. But, for the sake of demonstration, I will do it right now. Bam. Now the room game is saved, on. and the game is on. Now we are starting at the game start location, and once the game ends, when everyone perishes... Game over! Now it will respawn us in the figurative room that I've built here, which is the game over. And next game in 10 seconds. If we wait for the game to start in 10 seconds automatically, the respawn point is now right here and we will still be stuck spawning in this exact same spot. Game on! Yep, we are still trapped in this room. And with all of that out of the way, you have the basic setup for your quest finally complete. Okay, let's actually get into some actual game setups, yeah? We'll start out with the level gates slash Endor. What I mean by this is if you look in Isle of Lost Skulls or Crescendo, the levels are typically a bit bigger. And so to compensate for that, they will put level gates in the middle of the level to make sure that all the players are together and to make sure that all the enemies are cleared by the time they get to the second half or whatever part of the level so far. The setup is also used for the end door to the level where once all enemies are clear, players can get onto the board and then the door unlocks, and they can move on to the next level. For this setup, we are going to need a trigger volume, a state machine with three states, and for the sake of demonstration, I've created this orange cube, and the second orange cube to act as a makeshift gate door and um, end board. This is where you typically see the lock, and where you'll walk on for it to say, gather all players. Last but not least, we will also be needing a room info diff. We will also need a player event chip right here with the exclamation mark. To begin, we will set up the state machine to link to the first state, then to the second, then to the third, and for the moment being, we'll link the third back to the first. Then we will pull out a comparison chip. And we will take the number of players blue pin in the exclamation mark. And we will take the green pin total currently in zone to the red. After, we will take if red equals green and link it up to the second. Now, for whatever you're using to count up how many enemies are defeated, or whenever, 
for the moment being, I'll take a boolean. And take its output into from the first state into the second. This boolean, for the moment being, is acting as a signal output for whenever all enemies are defeated. Speaking of booleans, we will need uh, about two more, along with two more message chips. We will configure first message chip to say more enemies. Oh, goodness. To defeat. And we will configure the second message chip to say gather all players. Now, for both of the booleans, we will take the red one entering zone pin and hook it up to the red input, the boolean, and we will take the int state for the first state and hook it up to the green, uh, to the green of the first boolean, and the second state, int state, to the green of the second boolean. And lastly, just hook up the booleans to their respective message chips, and make sure it's connected to play for all, otherwise it'll play for just uh, player one, which happens, which is the first player who has entered the room. Now we will take our trigger volume and stretch it out and across the lock board. Now, since it's just me in the room right now, if I am to walk onto the board, since it thinks all the enemies are defeated, it will move on to the last state. Of which, after that last state, you can have it unlock a door or open an animation gizmo, disable a, a collision volume, whatever you want. Um, but what would happen if only one player got on here and there were more than one players at the moment? It would send out the message, gather all players. Now, if you're going to use this as a divider between level or a mid-level gate, as in Isle of Lost Skulls or Crescendo, going to need an animation gizmo and you can go ahead and connect that animation gizmo to the door of which you will have be opening then you simply create the animation you want where the door will open I'll make it really simple for the time being and we'll just have the door swivel to the left the center of mass is a bit off, so it's going to look a bit wonky. That's alright. We'll reset it to the start, and click done. Now, we'll take the on enter for the last state, and hook it up to the play for the animation gizmo. And we'll go ahead and configure the animation gizmo to stop at end so that it doesn't repeat on for infinity. Now. When I walk onto the board, now that all enemies are defeated and all players, aka me, is on the board, the door now opens, and we can walk through into the rest of the level. However, if you want to make it so this is for the end of a level, and this is the gather all players board to have players move on to the next level, then what you'll want to do is pull out a room door. And then configure it like we did with the first one. I like to hide the sign, force a new instance, everyone auto follow, and then link it to the next level subroom. Then what you'll want to do is get yet another Boolean chip, bring it next to the green pin here, and then wire the the in state on the bottom state to the boolean and we'll have the not 
green pin of the boolean hooked up to the lock. Now for the sake of demonstration, I've set the chip up the state machine so that it thinks that all enemies are defeated. I will walk onto the board. Now it thinks that all players on the board and all enemies are defeated. Now the door will be open and unlocked for us to move on to the next level. And that is the setup for a mid-level gate for your level. Or, at the very least, an end-level gate if you're going to be doing it in the style of Crimson Colgion, Golden Trophy, or Rise of Jumbotron. Uh, again, I would really only recommend using mid-level gates if your levels are quite longer, like the ones that I have in my quest, but it's a helpful thing to know in any case. Okay, so now that we have the end of the level and the mid-level gate set up, and the base of the quest set up, now we can get into where it gets fun. The enemies. For now, I'll just be focusing on the AI spawner basics and nav mesh before we get into how to actually create a proper AI wave. To start creating enemies, you're going to want to open your palette and search up a spawner gadget. Once you spawn it in, it should be purple and look like this. Next thing you'll want to do is configure the actual gray chip. And once you've done that, you can set how many you want, the time distance you want between. It's automatically set to two tenths of a second, but I think that's pretty fast. And once you have that figured out, you can click set object. And you can configure it to be any enemy you like, along with a few props, but those I rarely use. For demonstration purposes, I'll just go with a skeleton bottle thrower. This is the base setup for all enemies in Rec Room, and you can easily clone, copy, paste, and this is how you will be making your waves, of which you can configure each one to be however you like. Speaking of, let's get into it. To configure your enemy types and customize them to your liking, first thing you'll want to do is use configure on the actual enemy model itself and not the chip down here. Those are totally separate. Now once you've done that, you'll be greeted with a huge list of options. Each one typically has uh, max health, move speed, dash speed, which is just once they've found you and they're closing in on you, um, which is also, you can set the distance of when that can happen. Projectile speed, if the enemy has projectiles. Each one really has their own unique settings, so be, feel free to toy around with it. You can also use this team setting here to pit enemies against each other, or put them on team 1 to have the enemies on your team, in which case they will fight with you. Just be sure to set all the other enemies to any, or team 2, or whatever. This is also where you can change their color, which I like to coordinate each color version of an enemy with, different, with a different configure setup. Before we get into the nav mesh setup, I would like to go over a few more basics with these enemies. The main one being Remember your ink. Even though it is made from a gadget, once you spawn the enemy in, it does take up a little bit of ink. And if it's an Isle of Lost Skull skeleton, for example, the bottle it throws, or jug it throws, or bomb it underhand throws, also takes up its own ink. So, whenever you're making a quest level, just remember that your maximum ink isn't 100%, but rather, it's about 96%. If you don't have your ink that low, then if you set these enemy spawn gadgets to spawn, the enemies won't actually spawn because they don't have enough ink. This can be pretty confusing, especially when you're new to this, because even though in the settings it says that enemies have their own ink usage, that isn't the case. Now, if you want your beautiful enemies here to actually do anything, you are going to have to make something called Mav Mesh. 
Now, nav mesh is something you can find in the settings of your room. And it'll be in the main settings tab. You'll have to go pretty much to the very bottom. Right above the loading screen is your AI and nav mesh settings. Here it will show you your AI budget, or ink, which again can be confusing because they do take up ink. But what all this means is it shows you the active amount of AI. You can have a maximum of 10, so it'll just say however many you have, multiply that by 10%. It's really simple. What you'll need to do for nav mesh is simply click make nav mesh. Now, if you're running on a lower end device, I would really recommend saving your room first before you do this, because it can take quite a bit of processing power. But once you're ready and you have your whole level set up, you'll simply click Make Nav Mesh, and now you'll see this goofy purple looking stuff is now all over the map. If you don't want to see Nav Mesh while you're working on your map, you can simply turn off show in room, and then it won't be in your face. But I like to have it in while, at least while you're setting up the nav mesh. A few things to know about the nav mesh is that it can be misleading. Here, for example, it kind of goes like into the terrain. It really just means it doesn't mean anything. The enemy still will walk straight on here and then down this slope. It just looks weird. Enemies will only spawn on things that are set to be environment, physical, uh, sticky, whatever you're using, or invisible collisions. However, nav mesh will not spawn on very slim sections of land, which can be pretty frustrating. For example, if I pull out an invisible collision here, and I stretch it out to be roughly this wide, nav mesh will not spawn on this. If you take an enemy and you have it spawn on top of this, nothing will happen. So, if, for example, you want enemies to walk across the plank, but the plank itself may be too small, what I would suggest doing is taking a collision volume, stretching it out to be about twice, three times as wide as the actual enemy itself, and then just put that over the plank, and you can set it to be only applicable to uh, only collide with objects. Another thing to note with nav mesh is if you're trying to get a little creative, and maybe you have a small little section of land that nav mesh just refuses to generate on, and you put the AI there anyway. The AI simply will spawn there, stand for a little bit, get confused, and then commit on a live. Yeah, it despawns it pretty quickly. I believe the figure is about 5 to 10 seconds. And always remember that the AI's main goal, first, is to eliminate you, but then second, is to be sure that it's on nav mesh at all times. If it is off the nav mesh, like if I throw it into the ocean here, it's going to start running to the nav mesh, then run up to me, the player. As you can tell by my very well done presentation. Nav mesh will also create this kind of box thing, which is called the nav mesh bake volume. It can be kind of frustrating, um, but it does show you where exactly enemies can and can't go, and it's basically just this kind of almost invisible box. With all that Momo Jamba out of the way, Let's get on to actually creating enemy waves themselves. This next part is really quite simple, but there are a few extra things I would like to add in as someone who's been doing this for quite a while, um, so that you don't make some rookie mistakes first time around. To create an enemy wave, all you'll need is to set up your spawner combinations. Maybe here I'll set these to be some different Isle of Lost Skulls enemies. Maybe this could be a jug thrower, and this one could be a gibbet, which are these cage guys. 
Maybe I'll set this one to three with a difference of one second between spawns, and this one to two with a second uh, with half a second between spawns. Next thing you'll need is a boolean chip. Just to keep everything in order. And you can use that. Simply attach whatever input you want to start generating the enemies. Maybe it could be on game start. And then you hook this up to the first enemy you want to spawn. Or multiple. Start the wave. If you are using it to make enemies that are just kind of hanging out in the environment before you even get there, uh, you are going to want to be sure to configure the enemies behavior on spawn to be disengaged, but to automatically engage combat behavior when finding targets. This way, they'll just be minding their own business in the environment until they notice you, of course, in which case they will start to attack. Now, Boolean ships really are what I use the most in AI wave spawn creation, along with my good friend, the delay chip. With the boolean, you can count up. You can set the condition so that only once multiple enemy gadget spawners are defeated, then it'll send out a signal to start the next part of the wave, or to send it to a delay chip which you can set for however much time. Maybe I'll make this one two seconds long. It counts in every tenth of a second. And have that set up to the last enemy. Now to demonstrate what I've done here, I'll pull out a sword, start the wave, game over. and of course, game over. Obviously. Man, I'm bad at this game. Anyways, as I was saying, I'm going to push this button to start the wave. I'll show you what it is. Go ahead and take care of these gibbets here. And once I take care of this last gibbet, the boolean will take it in, except that small delay. And now, those two enemies spawned in, and now that I've defeated both of them, uh, that is the end of the wave. There are, however, a few golden rules that I would like to emphasize when you are creating your enemy waves. First golden rule, and I really mean this, do not spawn more than 10 enemies at once. As you've seen earlier in the game settings, the game can only hold up to 10 AI at a time. If you try to spawn in more than 10 at once, then the spawner gadgets won't be able to do it, and then the next enemies will just spawn in as soon as you defeat the other one. Oh. Anyways, as I was saying, the game can only hold 10 at once, and if the spawner gadgets can't spawn more can't spawn the and all of their enemies in time because you're asking the game to spawn more than 10 at one time, then it'll just spawn the enemy in as soon as whatever enemies are currently alive are defeated. And that can result in some pretty choppy gameplay, and it can be pretty abrupt for players, especially if while they're fighting the enemies, they get a little too close to the enemy spawn location. Which that brings me to my second golden rule, never spawn the enemies on top of players. It can seem pretty pretty silly to say out loud. Don't want to push that button again. But just remember, as you're placing in the enemy spawner placements, where is the player at the time that I'm placing this? 
since custom room AI are just spawned in immediately, and they're just immediately on guard, unlike in the Rec Room Originals, where they kind of come down from the roof with the with the yard, you know what I'm saying? And you get a little heads up that they're coming in. Since they just spawn in really quick here, you want to be sure to give the players plenty of heads up time to react, otherwise the spawn placement can just feel really unfair. To do this, I like to spawn enemies kind of behind a wall that the player might not see the other side of, or just keep them at least a little bit away from the player. Of course, you can break those two rules, especially if you're trying to go for an experience that is intentionally difficult and really tests the player's strength, such as a hard mode for your quest, or just a particularly difficult level in general. And if you're making a quest level that's really big uh, and open, you know, not so much going from room to room, but it's just one giant open area, then it's a little more loose. It can be a lot harder to tell where the players will be at that specific time. So just try to keep the enemy spawns closer to the edge of the map. This next part is really just general level design advice. So it's not so much concrete, here's how to, as it is just me kind of sharing my advice. So again, chapters in the description and on the side of the video, if you want to skip ahead, just go on and do that. There are really two kinds of ways you can make your level. You can either have it be like Golden Trophy, Jumbotron, Crimson Cauldron, where you're going from set room to room to room. Or you can do it in a much more open environment, like I stated previously, like certain levels in Eye of the Lost Skulls, or even Crescendo, where it's just this big open area, mid-level gates, the whole nine yards. The big open area is a lot better if you're trying to establish the environment of the level and really immerse the player in the space that they're in. However, it can be harder to set up story triggers and, of course, as I previously mentioned, know exactly where the player is at all times, so the level design can be a bit harder there. If you're doing a more room-to-room-to-room, -to -room -to -room, like I mentioned, it can be easier to set up story triggers with trigger volumes, for example, where once a player gets to a certain point, then this thing happens. It's a lot easier to keep track of where the player is, um, and the experience is a whole lot more linear, whereas with an open environment, uh, it's more customized to the player's experience. Both of these versions have their upsides and downsides. Uh, if you want some examples of them, you can go to my custom quest, uh, Fortress of Forgotten Foes, which is mostly room to room to room, uh, sometimes a bit of a mix of the both. Or you can go to the very first quest I made, Quest for the Orb, um, which has a lot of just open environments. Another thing to keep in mind, like I mentioned a moment ago, when making your level design, is to make it fair for the player. Try not to squeeze the player into exactly where you want them to go, and keep in mind, uh, especially the multiplayer experience. I've found that when I'm making quests alone by myself, which I often do, it can be hard to remember, like, oh yeah, other people are probably going to be running around the whole time. Just always keep in your mind, while you're building your level, where is the player at? By working your enemy spawn and your level design around that, you can make it feel really natural and make the gameplay really fluid for the player. Level gates also really help with that, especially if it's a longer level, but we already covered that. So, yeah. Another thing I'd like to add is really get creative with it. What I like to do with my rooms and my quests is to give each level its own kind of like gimmick or its own little thing to keep it interesting. Like, I'll add a game design element of bounce pads, or swim mechanics, or maybe one level is a darker environment, or has a lot of one specific enemy type, like melees, or a lot of ranged enemies, and build your level around that. Like I said earlier, it can really make the whole gameplay experience feel tailored to one specific thing, and it challenges the player in different ways in each level. It makes it more unique to you, and it just keeps it interesting. Players will definitely remember the experience more if it revolves around a certain gameplay mechanic that is really unique to your quest. But with all that mumbo jumbo out of the way, I don't even know if I'm making sense right now. Let's just get into the next thing. I forgot to look at the script. I don't even know what it's called. Let's just go. 
Okay, now that I've had something to eat, and I'm a bit more level-headed, let's look at perhaps the most challenging part of creating your own custom quest, the boss design. Now, of course, you can always just take a normal spawner gadget and configure its health up to a bajillion, change its color, change its projectile speed to be really fast, and uh, increase its speed. That's totally fine. I mean, it still challenges the player's skill in a really interesting way, and it can still lead to a really challenging climax of the quest. However, though it can be a lot harder, I would always suggest making your own custom quest boss, as it can lead to some uh, really unique um, and interesting ways of challenging the player in a way that a normal spawner gadget just really can't. One last thing I'll say before I get into it is that creating a boss can be really challenging at times. So again, there's no shame in just taking a spawner gadget and boosting its stats. But I will be showing you here how to use a damage counter and how to make trigger volumes that will hurt the player on impact, which you can then use with animation gizmos to kind of act as your own, how do you say, projectiles or damage points. I'll just show you how to do it. To begin, we'll go ahead and pull out uh, a basic prop. I uh, like to use plates, just something that is breakable and can be respawned. Next, we'll pull out another object respawner gadget, like so. And then we'll take out a trigger volume as well. To start, we're going to be using a lot of tags here, so we'll begin by taking the trigger volume to look for objects, have it filter by tag, uh, for here I'll just use DMG for damage, then we'll configure that object we had earlier, and we will give it the tag DMG or whatever tag you're using, doesn't really matter. Then we'll configure the object respawner to respawn that same tag. Damage, uh, clear velocity and rotation on respawn. And then we'll simply just move the trigger volume inside of the gadget and we'll pull up our little object, place it in there like so, and we'll freeze it. After that, I like to use a delay chip, but you don't necessarily have to. Just type in delay. I'll just set it to about one second. And we'll take the when exiting zone, link it to the signal. And then we'll have the output go to the respawn object by tag of the respawn gadget. Now if I pull out a weapon, like a sword, and I break it, it respawns. Now this can be used as kind of, in my quests I use this as a target mechanic, um, where once you use a weapon to <laughs> break a certain point, then a story trigger can happen, or something. But if you're using this as a weak point for your own custom boss, I like to use... the Combinator chip, and then link the red plus green plus blue, I totally butchered that, back to the red pin, and then also have the output of the delay, or just the blue if you don't have the delay, hook it up to also increase the value here, make sure it's just set to increase. Now, whenever you break the damage receiver, the value here will increase by one, and it'll count how many times you've broken it, aka hit the boss's weak point. 
Then what you can do with your boss, if you're using a state machine like I often do, uh, you can use a comparison chip, like this, and hook the red plus green plus blue, again butchered that, up to the right side, and then configure the left side to be how many times you want to hit the boss before something happens, like change to the next stage or phase of the boss, or just kill it outright. Here I'll set it to like 10. Then if you have a state machine, like go from phase 1 to phase 2 to phase 3, you can simply link the red equals green to the in-between state of the state machine. And really, creating your own custom boss is really personal. Um, you can use anything from explosion emitters to projectile launchers um, to deal damage or affect the player. But what I like to use the most is taking out a trigger volume. And a player set stat. Then simply configure the set stat to 1, the green pin, set the value to 0, make sure it's configured to health, and just connect the red when entering zone pin to the player pin here. You can then connect this trigger zone to like uh, a projectile that the boss is throwing at you, or one of its limbs that it's slinging at you, and if a player does go Game into it, <laughs> it'll set their health to zero and eliminates that player. The only downside to that method is that it ignores player invincibility, so if a player gets stuck inside of that trigger zone, it can be a little tricky to get him out of there. So just be sure that the trigger volume is always moving and rarely stays Game in the same on. spot. Anyways, those are just the basics to boss design. Um, I'll throw up a few pictures on screen right now. As you can see, like, with this Hydra mini-boss that I made, for example, it gets really complicated. So, again, it's really up to creative interpretation for this part. Just do whatever you want to do. And that is the end of my very surface-level tutorial on custom quest-level creation. Um, I hope this helped you a little bit. If you have any questions whatsoever, please ask them down in the comments. I will do my best to answer each and every one of them. And yeah, one more thing I'd like to add is um, regarding everything I just said earlier about the rules and stuff. Forget them. Break them. The whole point of custom created content in games here like Rec Room is to break the boundaries, try new things, and do things your own way. Just know that it does take some circuit knowledge to be able to do this kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, remember to playtest. Remember to polish everything to the point where it feels fluid enough. And happy quest making for all of my returning followers who are here. Um, hi, this is what I sound like. Kind of weird. I don't think I've used my voice for anything online since, ooh, maybe early Quest for the Orb versions, but that's about it. Um, I don't plan on leaving Rec Room quite yet. There are still a few more projects I'd like to do here, but um, the amount of time I'm going to be spending on the platform is going to be going down quite a bit. I have other things in my life. Um, I'm moving on to like college and stuff. So yeah, it, not, not a lot of time left for these silly little quest things from now on are just going to be like mini quests and compilations and stuff. So sorry about that, but I hope that you can take some inspiration from what I've made. Um, and if this tutorial at least, <laughs> if the things I've made in this tutorial at least help one person in their own creative missions, then I've done what I've set out to do here. Remember to subscribe, and remember, keep doing your rec room best. This has been John's the Wizard, and I will see you all next time. Goodbye. <laughs>